I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, I thank everyone that's present, except Sheila, who resigned last week. Uh, item two on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Are there any additions to the agenda? So, have we in the past had an area down here that says um, center advisory board suggestions, or am I thinking of something strange? No, that, that's usually where it goes, it's down your future agenda items. Okay. So, did, did I miss something? Well, I'm just wondering if, no. Now that, I think that's where we can put the suggestions for future uh, agenda items. Or even if people have thoughts or congests and concerns or whatever. Or oh, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I okay. guess that's just kind of a catch all. Catch all. There we go. Yeah. But we do pay attention to it. You know, we, we get to it sooner or later. You know. <laughs> all right. Are there any uh, additional questions or items for the agenda? If not, I'll, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Is there a second? I'm uh, sorry. sorry. Second. I just want to make sure that uh, we're, it's going to be a time for, for for us to give a little report on the. Yeah, there should be. We got we built in a little extra time today. Okay. So I'll try to keep on schedule. Um, okay. Um, is a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, previous month's minutes. And any corrections or additions to the minutes? I have a question. Yes. Um, it says in here that the, uh, the um, when we presented to the city council. Yes. That you were going to do everything. I don't think it says that. It does. It's on page two. It does. It says it was unanimously approved. So I was just wondering what changed. That's all. And actually, how it could change. I mean, how does it, the legislative process works if that's the way it is in here, and then it changed? Well, the way I interpreted that was handle presentation, meaning I could do it however I wanted to. That's the way I took it. And I needed, frank, frankly, I needed Lonnie to handle the housing. But your point is we need to do exactly what we say? My, my point is, I, I just was trying to understand the whole thing there. If, but you explained that you said, you understand it as you could handle it wherever, however you wanted. I did not understand that part. Okay, well, I don't think we actually said that. But that's the way I did it. <clears throat> I, you know, I could have done it, I, I could have handled it had you do part of it. I'm do part of it. Just to make it part of it. No. Anyway, that's why I did it though. Yes, ma'am. Um, when we were getting ready for all this, um, Ronnie spoke to Dave, who then spoke to me, and they were, their idea was it would be more meaningful to have the people who were actually working on the topic get up and speak about it. It would be more accurate. It would be more, you know, there'd be more enthusiasm because it's what I've been working on for a year, that sort of thing. So at one point, Ronnie said, if you would do it and, and Arlene would do her part for the um, transportation, Dave can do everything else. And at first I was hesitant. I really didn't like the idea, but you know, then I started thinking about it and I thought I shouldn't be worried about it at all because when I get up to speak to anybody in this capacity, I know more than they do. You know, I know about housing and they really don't. And so I shouldn't feel intimidated. I should feel like I'm sharing information that I want them to know about. And that's exactly the reason I asked you to do it. Yep. So, but then Arlene decided she didn't really feel comfortable doing her transportation part. So they did pick that up. But that's a point I want to make in the future because I've been doing this with another board I'm on that we had to present to the to the um to to Harold and stuff. Anytime you get up to speak about anything that you've been working on, you probably know more than they do. Um 
Their city council may have an array of things that they're involved in. They don't know details of every single thing that's going on. So they may even, in a way, rely on you to kind of fill them in. You know, give me more information, give me details, things like that. As we were doing the presentation, you could see people on the, on the city council up on the dais kind of nodding and kind of, oh, you know, reacting in that way. Because I'm sure we were sharing things that they didn't, they weren't really clear on. So um, I can see what Arlene's saying for sure. If we make a decision at a meeting, it has to stick that, that way um, until we do another vote if we have to. But as far as the reason behind it, that's really where it came from. Ronnie was pretty clear on, he's seen a lot of presentations and he's just going through some courses that show you how to do presentations. And it's always good to get different people because it's not one person droning on by the end. You know, it's different people giving different information and, uh, and it just seems to be more engaging for people. Well, I'm so sorry I hope that clears it up a little yeah, bit. I, th I think it does. I'm sorry there was any uh, misunderstanding or miscommunication. I think in the future, we need to be clear just exactly. Next year, if we do the same thing, I want to talk about this a little later. But if we do the same thing next year, I think we need to be clear uh, who's going to do what, just for the sake of okay, So, so that, that's a good point. Just clarification. It wasn't that I felt uncomfortable to get up and talk. It's just that I understood this that you were to take it and that's why I said no so that was just a matter of clarification okay. so I understand now okay any other corrections or comments if not would someone move to uh, adopt the minutes line mm -hmm. so, so moves a second John seconds any discussion all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. opposed motion carries all those the public invited to be heard, is there any public to be heard this morning? Hearing or seeing none, we'll move on to, uh, in deference to our speaker today, I'm going to introduce Zach Lance. I don't know the exact title of your office, the Office of Sustainability. Oh, Correct. close, yep. Office yep. of Sustainability. <laughs> and uh, I, I, uh, being on the sustainability liaison, I've listened to him a number of times. He's quite good, he's very knowledgeable, and I look forward to your presentation, so I'll let you introduce Thank you. yourself. Thank you very much, and I'll take your comments to heart. I uh, was hoping to bring Lisa with me today. She is the uh, sustainability manager, but unfortunately her husband tested positive for COVID, oh, so yeah. she's staying home today. It's still oh. out there, so be safe. I haven't seen her in a week and a half, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm good. But um, she sends her regrets. Sorry, she couldn't would, be here today. Excuse me. Would either does anybody want to sit over here for a better view? Okay. And Chuck. And also, do I need to turn off the lights? Yeah, probably. Some okay. lights up. Okay, Chuck. All right. Here it goes. All right. So uh, thank you all for having me out today. Um, my name is Zach Lance. Uh, I'm a sustainability coordinator in the city's Office of Sustainability. Um, I have got about a half hour on the agenda today and a lot to cover, so um, we'll probably hold some questions till the end if we have time for that. But I have left uh, a few of my business cards and our newsletter sign up on the side table over here. So the best way to uh, stay engaged with our sustainability work is to sign up for that newsletter or get in touch with me uh, if you have any follow-up questions or other things you'd like to chat about. So um, on our agenda today, I just want to give a brief introduction to the Office of Sustainability. I want to um, focus on uh, sort of an overview of all the work we've been doing around extreme summer heat over the last uh, two years or so. And then I'd love to get your all's feedback on our proposed next steps for continuing to engage with the community around extreme summer heat. It's a really important topic and um, we'll dive into that in a moment. But uh, just a brief slide here to show our Office of Sustainability here at the city. Um, we've grown quite a bit in the last few years. Uh, it used to just be one or two people for quite a while, but now we've really built out an awesome team. So um, we've got someone who focuses on zero waste and the universal recycling ordinance that was passed recently. We've got two folks who work on business sustainability. So if you guys own businesses or know folks who do, we'd love to get them as part of our sustainable business program. 
We have an equity and engagement uh, coordinator, Laura, who's awesome. Uh, and then Francie does all of our internal sustainability work. So city operations, that sort of thing. So really great team here. Um, just quickly uh, to share Longmont's sustainability vision. This does come from the sustainability plan, which was first adopted by city council in 2016 and then updated shortly after in 2018. Um, it's due for another update soon. But our sustainability vision is an engaged community. Thank you all for being here and being engaged that promotes environmental stewardship, economic vitality, and social equity to create a sustainable and thriving future for all. So a lot of folks, when they think about sustainability, they think about the environment, right? Um, pollution, all sorts of those environmental impacts. But we really try to incorporate um, what you may recognize as the triple bottom line. So we talk about people, and we talk about the planet, and we talk about prosperity as well. So all those things work together to uh, create a sustainable Longmont, a sustainable Boulder County, uh, hopefully a sustainable plan. We've got a lot of different sustainability targets. Um, these are just three that I wanted to highlight because they're related to the extreme heat topic of today. Um, you can find more about this if you'd like on this great new website we launched earlier this year uh, called Longmont Indicators. So if you, if you just Google that or look up indicators.longmont.colorado.gov, uh, you can basically see an overview of the city's sustainability plan, Envision Longmont, uh, some of the transportation plans, and all the different um, sustainability targets that are part of those plans and how they all interact and how we're doing on all of them. So we report twice a year on every single one of, I think, 250 different targets. Um, so it's a really great way to stay updated on everything. Um, just to highlight a few here, uh, we're shooting for a 66% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Um, we have a 100% renewable electricity goal by 2030 and 30% uh, zero emission vehicles by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So all of these things in one way or another relate to uh, extreme heat and air quality, ozone, um, which I'm going to be talking a little bit more about today. So just to kind of set the background here, um, this may be obvious to a lot of folks, but I want to make sure uh, we all understand why this topic is important. Uh, we just had a, a couple stretches of very hot weather. Um, June was the second hottest June on record, I believe, in Colorado. And I think we had something like 12 or 15 air quality alerts, which is uh, more than we've seen in recent years. Um, so obviously a, a, a timely issue here. Um, but this matters also, of course, because of the health impacts. So um, we know that uh, certain people are, are more likely to uh, feel the health impacts of extreme heat. Um, so that's this dis disproportionate vulnerability. So that definitely includes older adults, um, younger kids, any people with breathing problems or other disabilities, uh, folks who work outside and maybe can't change their schedule because they need that income from their, their outside job, um, people who are unhoused, all sorts of other folks are, are certainly vulnerable to extreme heat. Um, if, you, if you didn't know, uh, extreme heat kills more people in the U.S. than any other climate-related disaster. So more than tornadoes, hurricanes, floods. Um, yeah, about over 1,200 deaths per year in the U.S. So it's really that silent killer, right? You don't see the tornado coming. You don't get a weak notification of the hurricane barreling down. Um, maybe we, we have a few days forecast to know it's going to heat up, but um, if someone's air conditioner breaks and they're unable to stay cool, it can become a real problem very quickly. Of course, there's quality of life impacts. Nobody likes uh, being outside and sweating too much. Um, a lot of folks you know, are forced to adjust their daily schedule, uh, maybe turn up the air conditioning and spend more money on utilities, which not everyone can afford. So a lot of quality of life impacts. Um, that, of course, leads to increased energy and water use. So as I just said, if you're cranking the air conditioner, um, that means we need to generate more electricity. About half of that electricity in Longmont right now comes from non-renewable sources, so coal and natural gas, which, of course, create emissions and just continue to contribute to climate change. So sort of a, a vicious cycle there. Um, water use obviously increases as well. Uh, everybody likes to keep their lawn nice and green and their landscapes looking good. 
So if it's drier and hotter, we've got to use more water to accomplish that. Same goes with agriculture as well. Um, extreme heat obviously will exacerbate drought, just suck that moisture out of the environment even faster. It can increase runoff when we do have a rain event. Um, if the rain is not ready and able to absorb that, uh, sorry, the soil is not able to absorb that water. Of course, wildfire risk increases as it gets hotter and drier. And then ozone is a really important one we talk about. Um, if you're not familiar with ozone, essentially a lot of the emissions um, that we create from our vehicles and our homes and everything reacts with sunlight on these hot days and creates ozone, ground level ozone, which is very unhealthy. Um, it's not the same as the ozone that's way up in the atmosphere protecting us. So that's why we get those ozone alerts here so often. Um, there are also infrastructure impacts to extreme heat. Mm -hmm. So our roads and our roofs need to be repaired more frequently. Maybe our air conditioner has to get replaced more often if we're using it more. And then there's an ecosystem impact as well. So all of our awesome wildlife has a harder time surviving. A lot of our plants aren't adapted to those hot temperatures. So we're, we're starting to see some ecosystem impacts as well. Um, and just to note here, when I'm talking about extreme heat, um, I'm really talking about days that are 90 degrees or hotter. It was like 89, 88 the other day, and I was like, whew, feeling yeah, cool. Glad we got out of those 90s. Um, but that is essentially the, the 90th percentile of like average temperature here. So anything above that uh, is considered extreme heat. And that's not just for long run. So um, I would like to do a quick recap of our work so far. There's a lot of it, so I'll try to go quick. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we can follow up on any of these things if you'd like more information. Um, so the first thing I wanna present here is a really awesome tool we put out earlier this year called our Climate Risk Mapping Tool. So uh, we developed this as an internal team here at the city to better understand localized risks of climate change. So there's a lot of maps out there that are at a much larger scale, maybe Boulder County, uh, maybe census tract level, but we were able to zoom in even farther, break the city up into what we're calling neighborhood districts, um, and then really uh, evaluate each one of those on a, on a really wide set of criteria. So this uh, screenshot you're seeing here is the risk map for extreme heat. Um, I can share these slides afterwards. I've got the links here. Um, so you can go to both a story map that kind of walks you through this entire project as well as uh, an interactive map where if you've ever used GIS, um, you can turn different layers on and off. It's really amazing. You, you could overlay this heat map with a map of uh, population over 64 years old, for example. We've got layers that show rates of diabetes and cancer, um, access to transportation, right? Folks maybe don't own a car or have easy access to public transit. Um, so we've got a lot of social indicators and a lot of economic indicators in there as well. We basically bring all those pieces together for each neighborhood district to give it a score on how vulnerable it is to extreme heat. So this really um, tells us which communities, which neighborhood districts are gonna see the most extreme heat and which ones might not be able to uh, respond to that adequately. So they don't uh, maybe have as many economic uh, resources to, to be resilient. So it really helps us focus our work on, on where it's needed most. Um, these ones that are grayed out have very few people living in them. So for privacy, we basically don't share that because there's like less than 25 residences or something in those grayed out areas. Um, but these darker ones are the ones that are uh, sort of ranked highest uh, for extreme heat risk. So as I mentioned, it evaluates our capacity um, to adapt to climate risk on a neighborhood district scale. Um, the other climate risks are included in this project. Of course, it's extreme heat that I've mentioned. We also have extreme cold, air quality, and flooding all evaluated in this as sort of separate analyses. So really awesome project there that we're using literally every day to guide our work. <coughs> this is another uh, fun, colorful map that I helped create last year. Uh, this was what we're calling our heat watch project. So uh, last summer, I believe in July, um, we had, I think, 22 volunteers attach a heat sensor to their car. I actually sat out here in the shade in front of the senior center all day and handed out the equipment. Um, and they drove preset routes around town 
and that heat sensor collected the temperature and the humidity uh, at that point every second as they drove. So this allowed us to reveal what we call the urban heat island effect. Um, if you're not familiar with that, you've probably experienced it. Uh, it's basically just the idea that all of our solid surfaces, like roads, uh, parking lots, rooftops, and whatnot, um, heat up during the day. They absorb that solar energy, and then they hold it a lot longer than green surfaces, you know, open space and trees. So you get these islands, these heat islands, uh, where that heat really has a hard time dissipating overnight. So we had our volunteers drive the same route three times on the same day. They went early in the morning, then they went midday, and then they went again in the evening to see how those temperatures changed. They drove the exact same way every time for about an hour, and then we cut the data off and uh, used, used those uh, temperature readings to kind of extrapolate this map. Um, so you can really see the areas along Ken Pratt um, and Main Street here uh, have some heat islands, especially North Main Street. Um, we did work with a consultant on this to help create it, and they were amazed that our heat islands um, are, are fairly narrow along those corridors. In other cities where they've done this, they see that heat spilling much further out. So um, the takeaway there was that we've actually got pretty good tree coverage uh, on the blocks like adjacent to Main Street, maybe not right on it itself, but it helps um, dissipate that heat island effect quickly. Um, and then you see a lot of cool spaces, right? Golf courses. Um, this is actually a substation for one mile power. We're like, oh, there's a hot spot there. So there's a lot of electricity uh, passing through. So um, really interesting. Again, this is all available online. I can send the maps, uh, the link, so you can click around um, and explore it yourself. But um, we, what we saw was that green spaces and trees offer up to 10 degrees of cooling. So if you move from a, a bright red to more of a blue, there's about a 10 degree difference in our temperature. So that really makes a difference um, for cooling our homes and, and keeping our bodies cool and safe. Excuse me. Okay, um, last year I also led a community engagement effort. Um, we did a handful of workshops in English and Spanish, um, specifically for residents of Spanish uh, Spangler, Langan, and Kensington neighborhood districts. Um, we were already doing some works in, in those areas and they have awesome public parks. So we decided to focus on those first. Um, we asked folks to come in. We gave them a $40 utility bill credit for their time to come and work with us. Um, and they basically learned about a variety of cooling solutions. So things like planting more trees, putting shade canopies over playgrounds, um, offering cooling support at your home, uh, emergency cooling centers, splash pads, and uh, water features. Uh, and then they essentially ranked which of those they would like to see in their community. They kind of voted. Um, <clears throat> and then we got out our colorful stickers and started putting stickers on maps of where they would like to see those things implemented. So um, I'm proud to say that we are moving forward with a few of the cooling solutions that these folks came up with. Um, it's going to take another year or so to get a funding approved and kind of construction started, but it sounds like we're gonna be able to put um, shade canopies over playgrounds in, uh, I believe, all three neighborhood districts. Um, so that'll help keep those playground structures a lot cooler. And then we're gonna do shaded benches and seating for parents and adults on the side as well. So um, making those parks a, a really cool space, literally cool <laughs> for folks to come and uh, escape the heat. We also did a citywide survey last year. You may have seen this. Uh, we got over 840 responses. It was really awesome. 33% um, or a third of the folks who responded uh, indicated that they were 65 years or older. So it's actually a little bit of an over-representation of older adults um, because it's the proportion in one month is slightly less than that. But we asked a whole bunch of questions. Um, I'm not gonna go through them all here today. But I, all this data I'm showing is specific to that 65 plus age group. Um, I kind of zoomed in on that data set and looked at uh, uh, what their responses were. So one question, where do you feel affected by heat? The top three answers were during recreation, 65%, um, at home during the day, and at home at night. Um, we also asked like during transportation, those things uh, tended to rank a little bit lower. And that was consistent with the other age groups we saw as well. Um, a few more questions we asked here. Uh, does summer heat disrupt your daily life? 
60% of that 65 plus age group said yes. So uh, well more than half said summer heat impacts them. Um, do you have, have you experienced health impacts from heat? 12% said yes, and 16% weren't sure. Maybe they had, maybe they hadn't. They, they weren't sure if it was related to heat or not. Um, we wanted to gauge people's awareness and knowledge of this issue. So we asked, how much do you know about a series of things? Uh, one was the signs and symptoms of heat illness. Only 29% knew a lot. So we see a gap there where we can do more education and outreach on uh, what to look for to keep folks safe in those hot temperatures. Um, we asked about, do you know ways to keep your home cool? Uh, much more higher percent, almost half knew a lot. So maybe we don't need to focus on that quite as much in our outreach. And uh, why urban areas are hotter. So that heat island effect, 42% thought that you knew a lot about that. So really helpful to guide our work. Um, this one was probably the most interesting to me. Do you have a working cooling system at home? Almost 9%, almost 10% of seniors responded no, which is more than any of the other age groups we looked at. So that's obviously a problem because we know older adults are pretty vulnerable to heat. So that's something we're working on and it's part of the reason why we're here today talking to you all. 76% um, had central air conditioning, 10% have window, AC, some swamp coolers, only 1% has a heat pump. Um, I'd love to talk to you about heat pumps if you want to learn more, they're awesome. Um, but we gotta get more of them out there. Oh, and then um, if we have a moment here real quickly, I was just curious if this reflects your experience with heat or the experience of your community, in your neighborhood. I've seen some nods as I'm, I'm going along. Folks agree, you've experienced heat, yeah. I have a quick question. Sure. You, you noticed, or you noted three different neighborhoods? Yeah. For cooling, you know, mm -hmm. you mentioned cooling up. Yeah help. Um, what about the others? What? So we're going to continue to work through the rest. Uh, okay. This is a multi-year effort. Okay. So okay. this year we have decided, uh, I had the idea to maybe not just focus on geographies and arbitrary boundaries that we've kind of drawn around these neighborhoods, but uh, groups of people. So this year our, our kind of target groups are older adults and the Mountain View neighborhood. So I'll show that one here in a little bit as I talk about what we have planned for the rest of this year. But great question. You we were already doing some work there and there are qualified census tracts. So we, we had ARPA money basically to do work in those neighborhoods specifically. So we were able to kind of pull some things together. Um, and that's how we can pay for those shade structures and those other things I was talking about. That's well, my neighborhood, there. there's Roosevelt and there's Thompson. Yeah, yeah. And so I was wondering where they stood as far as getting some help with them. Yeah, well, Thompson's being redone anyway. So yeah, they may be putting things in that they didn't have. Okay, thank you. What's your, what's your focus with seniors or older adults? Yeah, so uh, we want to do a lot of the similar things we did last year um, in those workshops so that we can kind of compare across uh, years, if you will. But um, we're starting here with you all so we can learn more. But I'm going to show in a minute what my planned next steps are. Essentially, we want to hear more about your all's experiences and how we can offer more support. So as we see here, we think we need to do better telling people about the signs and symptoms of heat illness. Um, that's also Boulder, Boulder County Health responsibility as well, so we'll partner with them. Um, but we also, you know, we know a lot about how to keep our bodies cool, right? Adjust your schedule, drink more water, go into the air conditioning. We know a lot about how to cool our buildings and our homes. So weatherize them, better insulation, heat pumps, that sort of thing, drawing the blinds, fans. Um, but we don't know a lot about cooling neighborhoods. So at that neighborhood scale is really what we want to learn more about. So, you know, I mentioned things like planting trees, uh, which obviously can create cooling in a neighborhood, but um, trees take a long time to grow. We really only have uh, the ability to do work on city-owned land. So a lot of private lands, you know, there's not a lot we can do there to support trees yet, but we've got some ideas. So essentially we want to learn more specifically about kind of neighborhood cooling. But I think I'm eating up my time here, so I'll cruise right through. Um, lastly, another program we've got going on is called our Whole, whole Home another, Health Program. I'll give you another five minutes. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so we're doing free home energy assessments and efficiency, basically, to try to help people weatherize their homes and then electrify their homes. So installing heat pumps and whatnot. Um, specifically targeted to lower income 
uh, residents here in Longmont. It's a great partnership with sustainability, Longmont Power and Communications, our housing rehabilitation program, the CARE program, which is statewide. Um, and yeah, we're really trying to focus on these folks who are impacted by extreme warming. So uh, in the name of time, I'll keep moving on. Um, I really want to chat about our next steps. So um, we've certainly got an ongoing citywide communications and heat action plan. We actually did a whole kind of communi uh, sustainability communications review and have a really awesome plan that we're starting to implement now. So hopefully you'll see some more pieces of that coming out. Um, if you get uh, or read uh, CityLine, we've had the kind of feature cover article there for, for several months now over the summer. Um, so doing all sorts of targeted communications and outreach. Um, I mentioned the cooling solutions implementation, so splash pads and shade structures, uh, still working on that. Um, and actually we had a meeting about this yesterday, the English and Spanish workshops for Mountain View, as I mentioned, and we actually just had to take a slightly different approach uh, because that neighborhood district is, is very different. There are, just within it itself, there are um, two mobile home communities. I know there's a 55 plus HOA. Um, there's some assisted living facilities, a lot, a few apartment buildings. So um, as of yesterday, our plan is actually to go uh, specifically into those mobile home parks uh, and start to work with those residents about how they're experiencing heat and how we can uh, help them stay cool and safe. So evolving project there. Um, but these engagement ideas are what I'd love to get your all's feedback if you have time. Of course, uh, send me an email or, or give me a call if things come up later if we're out of time. Um, but I had the idea to, uh, and I haven't run this by Ronnie or anybody yet, uh, but to have a uh, sort of interactive um, self-guided display out here in the uh, lobby of the senior center. So we basically present those cooling solutions I was talking about, tree planting, shade structures, uh, home cooling support, um, and then again, have people vote for what they, they think we should focus on. Um, and then start to pin those on a map. So, you know, maybe my street is really hot, we don't have any trees, I always walk my dog this way, let's try to get more trees along that street, that sort of thing. Um, we'd love to have folks leave notes or even like voice messages about your personal experiences and the hot spots you're seeing around town. Um, and then we might try uh, giving away some cooling kits. So we keep them behind the desk here, um, things like little personal misting fans, um, electrolyte tablets, um, there's some towels that you get wet and hang around your neck and really help you stay cool. So we're interested if, uh, to see if people are, are interested in those, if that's something they would like and use or not. Um, we also are, are gonna do some meetings with Meals on Wheels, um, Cultivate, the nonprofit that focuses on supporting seniors. Uh, we already met with our public safety team on this. Um, and then folks who took our survey last year, uh, we had a question, can we contact you for further engagement? So I'm going to start contacting those folks as well this year um, to learn more. Um, so I'm curious if you all have ideas about other groups we should be talking to or meeting with, um, just to share this message, to tell them about this work, and to know that, uh, to ask them, like, Meals on Wheels, when you're delivering meals on a really hot day, if somebody doesn't have air conditioning and they're really doing bad, like, let us know, let's get them connected. What are you seeing out there in the community, essentially? So, um, in our last few minutes here, um, quick uh, question and discussion. Do you have ideas for further engagement, um, specifically with the older adult community, or I guess really with any other groups here in Longmont? Um, and then Dave brought up a good question, how can this board um, support this work as well? So, um, not sure we have time to get in a deep discussion on that, but I'm happy to follow up uh, if it's something you all would like to kind of support moving forward. Awesome, that was a lot, I'll leave it there. Any other questions, um, ideas, thoughts on having that display out here, meeting with those other groups, um, other ways to, to learn more from the older adult community here? I think um, I think having the display out in the, in the lobby is a great idea. You know, work well. People come in and out of here all day. Yeah. So this is a great way to, mm -hmm. to pass out information and let people know what they can do in case they're feeling like they're getting a little overwhelmed by heat. Yeah. Yeah. I also think this board is good at helping out, volunteering for things, mm -hmm. you know, being available to do that kind of display. Sure. Um, so I think if you need boots on the ground type of thing. Yeah, that was my reason for doing it is I can't sit there all day every day, but um, 
that would be great to have folks checking on it and give me a call, hey, we need more pins, or um, this is you know whatever issue we're seeing. So thank you. Yeah. I'll reach out and get that going. Perfect. There are uh, free home ass uh, assessments that you talked about. Yeah. How do you get that information out? That's a great thing. Yeah, um, there's a lot of different ways you can sort of start that process. Um, one is through the program you did uh, with me. It's a, a separate program called Soul, where we come out to your house and we do a 90 minute sustainability chat, basically. We can talk about anything you're interested in. And then we can refer you to other programs, to that whole home health program. Um, but specifically what we're looking there uh, is, is for folks who are part of the Longmont Cares program. You know, that one that helps um, pay a portion of lower income folks utility bills. Oh, good. So we, we kind of look at those folks first um, and then ask them to do an energy audit of their house. We put a fan in your door and try to suck air through and find air leaks. Because the first thing to do is improve essentially the insulation and the weatherization of your house. And then we come in and fill any gaps that that program um, can't complete. So often they don't have enough funding to help you put in new windows. Maybe we can tap into other funding. So um, there's a lot of entry points to that, but if you get in touch with me, um, I can give you my card. Uh, I'm happy to put you in touch with Adam, who runs that program. And, um, we can ask some questions basically to see if you'd be a good fit. Yeah, great. Right. <clears throat> Personal experience. I think it might relate to this. Uh, I consider myself fairly well informed, but I was playing golf last August and I played 18 holes and I drank two bottles of water just like I'm supposed to. And I got back to the parking lot and I couldn't find my car. I went home, I drove home, I missed three turns. So, fortunately, I didn't crack the car up or anything like that. Yourself, yeah. And I don't know, I don't think I had a heat stroke, but I was affected yeah. by the heat. <laughs> so I guess my point is, uh, you know, I do think I'm reasonably well informed. I know I'm supposed to drink water and all that stuff. But I think what I'm saying is a lot of communication out there, TV ads, I don't know, I know they're expensive. But, mm -hmm. You know, you think you know what heat stroke is? Yeah. You know, add out there information yeah, absolutely yeah even for those folks who claim that they know a lot uh, it, it really helps i think you know you need to see something seven or ten times before it even starts to sink in but it does. Um, and i like your point that the the symptoms of heat illness you can't always see that right you might see somebody sweating or getting red but if it's you know sort of mental fog or fatigue there's no way to really know that uh, from from just looking at folks so Great point, and we need to share that as well. I'm just asking, do you have any pamphlets on that? Because that's a great idea. Uh, I don't specifically. Because then, um, then you'd be very useful here as the senior center. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure because the until does. Dave said that, I didn't really realize yeah. it could get that extreme. You know? Yeah, I'll see what we can find. I'm sure there's things out there already, and we can include that with our display as well, uh, or just have them here anytime. And I would love to have be able to get those slides so you can give us them. Yeah. Can I just send them to you, yeah. Ronnie? No, you have the right everybody. Everybody. Yeah, feel free to share my contact. Thank you. Yeah. You know, it, awesome. Along with that, that, that stuff sneaks up on me. Yeah. Really. <laughs> on something yeah. that you can communicate. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't hear what you said, Dave. I said it sneaks up on you. Oh, you yeah. don't know what's happening yeah. to you. Yeah. So that needs to be communicated. Can I ask something? Yes. Do you have slides that give a description of what to look for? I do. I, I didn't include those on time today, but yeah, I can certainly add those in um, for the, the ones we share around. And if I find a pamphlet, I can attach that as well. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. We'll, we'll schedule some time to follow up on some of these yeah. suggestions or recommendations. We'll see what recommendations the board has as well. Yep. And it has, uh, and also see what uh, educational opportunities. Uh, your department provides as we provide the space here and okay. uh, you can give that out to uh, in our, our group catalog yep. um, you know for the opportunity for people to learn about yeah. those symptoms and things to look for yep um, yep so i've done some classes here before and we've started putting some little uh different blurbs in the go catalog just to ask them in general uh, and there's some of them usually is on it yeah, yeah. 
Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and I'm sure I want to leave Lisa in and, and she will to meet you as well. Perfect. Those are our next steps. One, one form of correction. Is there anything that we can do as a board? Uh, is there legislation, for example, pending that we could send a letter to the representative or senator or something like that to try to influence that sort of thing? I like that idea. Or, or, uh, or to the city council. We just yeah. made some recommendations to city yeah. council. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know of any pending legislation at the moment, but I can certainly look into that. Um, and then in terms of things at city council, that's one way to go. Um, we've we've had some, not problems, but in the past, um, some climate related things were brought to city council and we passed a resolution and basically turned the whole sustainability office work upside down um, because they directed us to start doing other things, which we were already doing a lot of work. Um, so this was before my time at Longmont, but it's a good question, um, but I think we'd wanna have another meeting on that and really approach it in a smart way. Um, because if we create a sense of panic, right? That's one thing I've heard from these uh, surveys and feedback is don't stoke the fear, right? Climate is changing and it's horrible, but we need to talk about solutions. So if we bring that to council, it can really um, affect our work. And, and as you're seeing, we're already doing a lot. So mm -hmm. we want to just be uh, really cognizant of how we message that. So be careful. Those outcomes are. Yeah, I think it's not out of the question, but um, just from, I know Lisa would say if she were here, um, we want to make sure that it's not changing all this work we're doing already. So that's part of our work to communicate it and let council know that we're already doing this. So I'm here today. Uh, thank you all very much. And if you've got more on your agenda, uh, please reach out. I'm, I'm here to support uh, in any way I can. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> Um, yeah. I'd like to ask, we, we finished, we're, we're three minutes ahead of where we could be. So I'm going to ask the group, do uh, you want to pursue this with further discussions? Uh, with uh, maybe having Zach come back at a later time, maybe having another, just uh, another agenda item or two in the next meeting or two or three, and talk about the things that they might want to do. What's your feeling on that? Yes, Lonnie. I think we should definitely um, plan or be open to the idea of having something in the lobby, you know, that we could help out with um, as far as education and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And from there, we can see where the conversation goes. You know, we can start to see as people are becoming familiar with this topic, what ideas might come up for them and right? what right. suggestions they may want to they want to make. Make. Right. Anything else? Okay. Oh, I, I think it's a good idea. Right. Especially talking about, like you mentioned, that heat stroke. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of older people know about that. That's, that's, well, I tell you, it took me by surprise. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I guess we're ready to move on to the next item. Thanks again, Zach. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, Zach. Zach. Okay, let's go back to item five, old business, uh, food insecurity. John Higgins, 30 minutes. Okay, take it away, John. I've never, never been old business. That's, that's <laughs> well, first, first thing I, I learned when I started this looking was, when I went in the Army in 1968, the very first thing they said is, never volunteer for anything. <laughs> the exposure to this issue for me has been mind-boggling. Um, I sent the summary up, had a little bit of coaching from, from Ann, I'm taking this six or seven pages down to two. So that, well, that was interesting. We had a chance to look at this, I just want to go over it briefly before I start asking the questions for help. Um, the first thing I found was this multimodal comprehensive plan that's in 2016. And it is comprehensive, it's 188 pages long. And one of the first things they mentioned is how overdoses have become the, lar the largest section in the section of second of our population over the next 20 or 30 years. And this was done in 2016, so in the last eight years. That information was supported by them. Katie Weiser here, one on one. Meals on Wheels. One must home the largest population of older adults in the county. The population increased 46%. This is her statistic 
between that 2020 and 2030. And that people moving here to this part of the county from other parts because of financial stress, it's less expensive to live here as opposed to there. Um, 36% of the population in Boulder County do not feel they have access to affordable quality food. The most shocking thing I read was that older adults are even marginally food insecure. Present with the equivalent of being 14 years older than their actual age by physical complications from that. Mm -hmm. So someone who's 65 is presenting almost as almost an 80 year old because of food insecurity. Um, talked to Kim De Silva at the community food chair, and a lot of these people were referred to me by Christina. Um, she says something that friends have said for a while. There's a silver tsunami coming, particularly as boomers age and wrestle with the issue of self-sustainability in, in the face of higher food and medical costs. The statistic that Kim gave was that cost, meal costs in Boulder are up 28% since 2018. 18% 18 higher than the rest of Colorado and 37% higher than the average meal cost anywhere in the country. So food insecurity is, is, is quite the issue. Um, Dr. Kevin Rosigno at the Hour Center, who's in charge of food services, his first comment was he sees a lot of food stress for seniors, Latino families, and those families that support multi generational households. Um, the summary that, that, that I put forward is that everybody agrees that the, the impact on seniors. Seniors with disabilities, seniors with transportation housing limitations, seniors with Latino families, and seniors that are living in multi-generational households are most egregiously affected by this by food insecurity. So I went back and looked at the report that Lindsay Neville's group put out in 2016. And it came out again this recent they had actually a meeting here, 2024. Current Boulder, population, Boulder County population as of July 2023 is 326,831, 17%, 65 and older. The expectation between 2020 and 2050 in Boulder County, people over 60 are expected to increase by 50%, 58%, and the over 80 population by 244%. So we know there's housing, we know there's transportation. I'd like to see, that's, that's my last part here, moving forward is what is the Senior Center Advisory Board want to focus on regarding food and security for seniors to present the City Council in about a year. <coughs> My hope is that we can couple that with housing and transportation's goals because when you ask people what are the four basic needs, it's always food, transportation, housing, and I almost think what the four is. First three are always food, housing, and transportation. Probably health in some ways. I would think so. Some health. of them, it's, it's electricity and other parts of the world, but for mm -hmm. here, food, transportation, always. Food's always number one or two. And yet, with all the things that I've looked at, there's a lot of groups doing work in food insecurity, and I'm impressed by the work they do. And while all of them see a greater mission in getting out there, what they each said, some version of, there's not enough, there's not enough communication with people, to make them know, make them let them know what's available. Even community food share, they did 13 million pounds of food, most of which comes to Longmont. The majority of food distributed by community food share comes here. Mm -hmm. Our center, 90,000 pounds a month. Part of that is what they get from the Longmont food share, but they also raise their own. So there's a lot of groups doing this. So ultimately I'm asking, what do we want to do? Um, there's a need. It's a growing population. I don't see anything that specifically addresses food insecurity for seniors, except people that are doing it. The pantry, all the people are on the city website. So I'm not sure how to proceed. One is do we want to proceed? It's a big issue. And how do we do it? And as we move forward, I need some help in getting people to volunteer. You know, the first thing I said was don't volunteer. <laughs> I take that back. Well, because I think there's some specific, some more information we can gather um, to get a handle on how we want, what we want to present to the city council. I have some ideas on that, but I'd like to get some input in my remaining about 18 minutes of how the board would like to 
proceed. Anne. I was fortunate enough to have read John's full report, and it is incredible. And I suggested that it should be out there, like maybe in the Times call. We need a concise picture of what the food resources are in the long run. Because I think people get mixed up. Well, I was mixed up. I'll speak for myself. Uh, is there any way, well, I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but I would just like to see people more aware of what's going on. To what extent do you think that is a problem? People just don't know. Well, I think where to go. I think that's that's a big problem. Every person I talked to, the four organizations that I spoke with, um, you know, we could use more help, we could use more funding, but it wasn't a drive for them. The drive was we want to be able to get information out to people so they know where we are and what we offer. They also want to let them know about the SNAP program and other things where this food available. They didn't feel that enough people know about it. And I, my, my sense when they said that was if more people knew and more people came here, we'd find the funding and food. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's, it's, it's to rise to whatever the need is. I mean, consider, we're talking millions of pounds of food that come here. I mean, it's, it's pretty significant. So I think communication is, is a big deal. And our greatest platform without putting more work on the senior center is that people come through, it's a start, people come through here. What can we do? We talk about sustainability and whatever. You know, what can we begin to do to get information out there? Part of what I'd see if people help volunteer to help would be to go back to some of the organizations I spoke with and see how they would want to interact through this meeting here. It's the group we represent, the advisory board represents the senior center. What can we do without putting more work on staff to support that? Volunteers could help man a move about you know, putting it down. I don't know. But it certainly was an issue that everyone brought up in their own way. Lovely. I want to clarify something too, and you reminded me about it when you just said it. I always thought that the goal of the advisory board was to support our senior population throughout Walmart, to support them and advocate for them. One of the ways we can do that is to work with the senior center. But in my <clears throat> understanding, our responsibility is not to support the senior center only. You know, in saying that, it almost sounds like we're limiting, you know, we're here, we meet here, we're all about the senior center. In my mind, we're all about bigger than that. We're about underserved communities who don't get the information they need. We're about reaching out to get more people informed on what's going on. How does that sound to everybody? What are your thoughts on it? Well, I think that the Senior Center is a great platform. Sure. It's got seven or eight, nine, ten thousand people coming through here. Um, I absolutely agree. I think there may be some things we can do to even generate more interest. For example, I know that Food Rescue Group, what they do is they gather food from the farmer's market and farmers who have excess, and they bring it to Collier Park, and they bring it to refrigeration units they have in places. And they will they will help fund if you need more electricity they'll put the refrigerator here they'll deliver the food to that i mean with that kind of platform how do we get out to a senior community i mean chuck university or from the friends of the senior center they're struggling that's struggling they're looking for ways to make impact our community senior community also mm -hmm. but the fact that it's such an underrated issue and they're absolutely very, and they're very specific absolutely. It, it affects Senior disabilities, housing, housing, transportation, the Latino community. Everyone has said the Latino community, and especially those that are multi generational, are very hard hit by food insecurity. Very hard hit. The specific one I heard from I think in the Hour Center was multi generational families will put food on the table for children before they eat. And then the adults and last in that group by choice, by she You know, you, you, you eat first, kids gotta get in the winter. So there's a lot of need. The question is, how do we focus it from here? Okay. One of the questions about all concerns I have, maybe Christina can help a little bit with this, but 
you know, we get information from the city. I mean, almost everybody gets their electrical uh, notices. You know, I think it'd be great if we could come up with some kind of one-page form along with the, what we get, the information we're getting on services that are available in our community. Because I agree that communication and transportation is a big issue. You know, number one, people need to know that it's there. Mm -hmm. But number two, people have to be able to get there. And the other thing is, I mean, you, I mean, I don't know, some of these people you talk to, do they actually uh, deliver food to, to different places, you know? So I guess what I'm saying is, Christina, what would the person do? Yeah, would we have to just maybe go to uh, Marsha and talk to her about it and see if she could bring it up about adding a page? Or is there just too many demands out there that everybody wants? Well, you know, what I know about the utility bills is there is a lot of demand for people because it goes to every household. Right. Um, there is a lot of demands to um, put information in there. Um, and so I think it would be a couple of things. I think that, you know, through the resource specialists, they have all of the information, right? Um, you know, I'm wondering if... Um, Maybe something on the senior center website with, um, you know, part of the issue with resources is that once you pull together something in a pamphlet or even do a website, um, it's updated the, the next the next week. And so, you know, I'm wondering if there's the opportunity to like do some messaging around. Um, you know some of these issues whether it's food insecurity or or transportation um, and then really um, drive people to the right departments so you know sustainability or, or senior senior um, services um, I, I think that would be my only concern about that is that you know number one everybody wants a, a place in the in the utility bill I don't know if there's the the capacity to you know add something add something else in there and then once you pull together something like that it's, it's updated so we have the same discussion with uh, with families family resources and the same discussion with early childhood and with, with youth um, programs and I just don't know what what the answer is the county has tried to put a website together I don't know how many people use that Boulder Connect um, yeah, it, it's a tough one. So I'm it sorry, I don't have I don't have the. I thought I thought I'd just bring that up about it. Yeah. But the other thing that, you know, I, I think that we really. And, and and I don't know what the numbers are, but we we really don't uh, realize the number of people that don't have cell phones, computers, mm -hmm. yeah. internet, mm -hmm. things like that. And I'm talking about seniors, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Sure. I don't know. And so is it something in the newspaper? Do people have access to that? Is right. there um, is there things to, you know, where, other than the senior center, where do seniors um, congregate? Can we do something through our permanent supportive housing um, programs, through, um, through the suites, through, um, you know, something through Longmont Housing Authority? Like that would be the, the in my mind, the neediest of the needy, um, individuals and so is there something that we could work on um, with housing authority that would at least capture some portion of the population it's not going to capture everybody um, but that might be something to, to consider a partnership with LEJ um, maybe uh, looking at this you know talking to our resource team here um, uh, about that um, you know, what, what information is there maybe through the Area Agency on Aging, is that what it's called? Yes. Um, AAA. Uh, uh, maybe there's a partnership there to, to get the get the word out. Um, I think through the Food Security did you, Network. Did you read my list? You read it. Yeah. <laughs> my whole list. This is a secret. I haven't talked about this oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. First thing is contact you know, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to look for solutions at this point. Okay. It's such a big issue. 
It is. You know, I think it is. Maybe there's something we can well, do. Yeah. But, it's, but I think it's. I think there's several things we can do to get a little more information to kind of focus. What is, yeah. This group. What's your focus? I think is the, is the question, and then the other piece that I would add is um, kind of in framing this work, um, really to be aware of the capacity of the of the team. Um, of the of the senior services team here. I'm not hearing you ask that, you know, hey, take this over and do no. this. Not at all. No. Um, but just, just to be just to be aware of that. No, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Piggyback what Molly, Molly yep. said as far as having yep. volunteers and we can do things. Yep. But here's like here's that like first is something I want to pursue, second is I need some help. And third is I have some ideas and I've definitely started to say that there's a great resource with uh, Lindsay Neville that, that Ronnie's talking about coming out and presenting to the senior centers, the library board staff about what they're doing and what's available. So I'd like to con someone to help me contact her and find out what kind of ongoing things are that are happening. Kim DeSillo is an incredible source of information. Mm -hmm. She's the executive director of Community Food Share. Prior to that, she was 23 years at the Rocky Mountain Food Bank. And she's a wonderful person to talk to, but she's Said, look, just come tell me what you want. I have staff and statistics, and they have people. To your point, Meals on Wheels delivers 115, 120,000 meals this year. 90 percent is delivered to homes. Mm -hmm. So that, there's that access. We can partner with Zach to find you and go there and give some information about foods you can help with that. The Power Center, they deliver meals to one of their programs. They're delivering that. They're moving ninety thousand pounds of food a month just to the market every day. They deliver. So there's lots of stuff out there. So I'm contacting Kim and Silva. Actually, meet number three on the list. Meet with Christina because she's. I asked her one question about food insecurity. I got a page of things <laughs> to do. I said, be careful what I ask Christina for. There's <laughs> way, way too much information. Sorry. <laughs> it's like. Ask that question again, <laughs> um, but also discuss you know from her experience on our problems because in the food insecurity group that meets yes. once a month, there's a hundred some odd numbers. There, there are so many numbers, yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's a resource. I mean, just because I went looking, but I'm sure who else knows about? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So that we would, we would meet with Ronnie to discuss how the senior center, without impacting your staff, might be available to provide some kind of food, so like a food food rescue. And we put a refrigerator somewhere that to, to people get access to 24 hours. Is that a good idea? Great idea. Put it practical here. I don't know. But talk to you about that. See what the senior center might be able to do, if, if at all. Again, my primary goal is not to impact the staff here. They have plenty right. to do without adding more stuff to do this. And so, and I think it's important. I mean, we raise good questions. You know, how do we? How do we? What resources exist? How do we communicate these resources out? How do we bring awareness? I mean, who, who, who knows of these resources? So I think that work is important, yes. Um, you know, but as we, as we, the board, looks at how we, how we tackle or address food insecurities here within our own, you know, our, our direct community in Longmont, you know, um, narrowing it down outside of the county. What is it we are in control of? We do have the senior center care who provide who, who has space, has the capacity to, has the space, capacity to draw uh, and attention of, you know, as you mentioned, we have over 10,000 guests. A, um, I'll say visits because we don't know if it's in the right? Over 10,000 visits a month um, to our facility. As we look to expand hours, I did reach out to um, Ms. on Wheels to see if there's an opportunity to provide a dinner, right? But again, those resources for them that cost money, that you know, money for food, money for staff, those kinds of things. Um, so um, that's something that they're looking, they're exploring, and need to follow up with them on. And uh, you know, what about those levels? What other resources exist if we provide a location um, where food, uh, a location that people know they can come at five, six p.m. for dinner, for you know, same window of time. We can only do that thirty-minute window like those levels has. Uh, if it's not them, what other resources are available? that would be utilized to say we have a location, we have the draw, we have the need, um, can we provide that service uh, here at our facility? And 
I guess it explores a lot. So I just yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I, I just thought of one more thing, if you don't mind me giving you one more piece of information. There is another organization that I worked with, um, for, and it, you just reminded me of that when you said dinners. Um, when I was at the youth center, it is called um, Bondadosa. It's a nonprofit out of Denver, and what they do is they bring in huge um, freezer containers, um, and the organization packs them with um, meals. Uh, and then uh, delivery drivers come and they deliver these meals to homes. And so it started out as um, really something for children and youth to have that second meal in the, in the evening. Um, but I think at the time that I talked to them, uh, and this was during the pandemic, I think, um, they had like something like 1,800 households signed up in Long Island. So this that might be a good resource I, to to inquire about. Are you um, are you working with uh, with with seniors because this is the this is the need. So I'm going to send you the link. So because my time is up. <laughs> if you allow me to blather, so I don't have um, to go to hitchhike on Art's point. I have a neighbor that's like 88, 89 years old. We have to be careful about communication. She's got, a, she's got a cell phone, she's got a laptop, she's got a computer. She doesn't know how to use any of them. I'm serious. Uh, not very well. I know how that works. You get to be my age, you know, that, that stuff's tough, you know, and yeah. you, miss, you miss the technological wave. You know? I missed it, but I'm not sure. Man. But it's a problem, it really is. Uh, and so that's, I just want to raise that as a point. I think I think food, ins food insecurity is, is a great idea uh, approach, a great topic to spend our time on. I really do. Um, I also think it's just huge, as you say. It's almost too big for us to handle uh, in, in a meaningful way, unless we further define. We define it fairly specifically, is what I'm getting at. And to, uh, that's going on with your point, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that I always say needs assessment, uh, but that's really what we need. I look at the food sources around town, and I don't know much about them, I really don't. But from what I've seen, they seem to be silos, you know, like so many places, you know. Everybody builds their own kingdom, so to speak, and they're well meaning, but they're kind of all by themselves and they don't coordinate and collaborate like they should, you know. So I'm wondering if an approach could be we, uh, I know it's tough to put information together because, you know, I was impressed with all the data that you provided. It's all over the map, you know, different perspectives, different percentages of different things, you know, that kind of thing. But I, I would think one thing that we could do is to define it by putting together an estimate as best we could as to the total amount of food resources that there are available in the city, and there's a lot, and the total number of people by various groups that are in need of food. And once we know that, we can make some kind of a plan as to maybe we want to develop a food central and just setting that up, you know, it's like I think you're kind of suggesting something like that. And then we uh, maybe we can make, come up with some recommendations for immediate implementation through the center with Ronnie, for example. And then we can also go to the city council. You know, doing this stuff takes staff, takes money. Yeah. It always takes money to do stuff like this. So, you know, we could approach city council with a request for additional sources, resources once we have a better handle on the overall the dimensions of the problem. We know it's a problem. That, that, that's not the question. But try to further, further define it and then maybe take a chunk of it. And I think going to Christina's point, uh, I think we need to establish some priorities. You know, which group do we want to serve the most? And we don't want to serve cookies to the bridge club. You know, we want to get the sources to where they're needed. Anyway, that's my two cents. 
Yes, ma'am. I want to clarify something I was saying. So I looked this up. It says Longmont Senior Services Department is on a mission to build foster opportunities which promote dignity, wellness, independence, enjoyment, community, and a sense of purpose for older adults. So in the way I'm thinking, and I don't know if everybody thinks the same way, our purpose as an advisory board is to support older adults throughout Longmont. It could be in underserved communities. It could be um, in people who come here. It could be everything. But in the way I'm thinking of it is the senior center is part of that. They're not totally, everything doesn't revolve around the senior center, okay? And my concern about that is that there are people out there who don't know about the senior center, don't know what services they provide. So they're not, we're not going to be able to get that information about where food's available. We have to look outside the box on that one. We have to look in a bigger, you know, in a bigger sense um, to see how we really contact people throughout Longmont, no matter whether they leave their homes or not. You know, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of different things. You can't depend on the fact of getting information out just one way. So what I wanted to share was I live in, I'm sure you all know, I live in Village um, on Main, over on Main Street. And I'll give you an example of how we're supported by food. Once a month, um, oh, what's, what's Trader, no, what's the other big food store? The Trader Joe's? Whole Foods, Whole Foods, Whole Foods oh, comes Whole. in on a Sunday, once a month. And they bring groceries, they bring, um, they bring produce, they bring things like that, okay? So it's set up in the big community room once a month and people can go up and they can help themselves to it. Um, once a month, the farmer's market comes and they bring a whole bunch of food left over from the farmer's market. It's usually on a Sunday. And they bring in, they make it available and everybody can come up and they can do shopping. There's a, an organization called Brown Pantry, which is over on 15th and and Hover at West, Westview Presbyterian Church, and they do distribution of groceries twice a month. They're at the second Tuesday of the month and the third and the fourth Tuesday of the month. And then what they have left over on the second Wednesday of the month and the fourth Wednesday of the month, they bring to places like Village I made. And people can go and do some shopping. Now I, I just want I want to say this. This isn't this involves Longmont Housing Authority, all the buildings, all of their, um, you know, their communities. Um, so people are getting some sort of help. Um, we have a pantry area at the building that everything that's left over, you know, we kind of build up what people aren't using. So if you need it later on, you can go and do it. What I'm seeing too is that the idea of community refrigerators is becoming more popular. That's building up. People are starting to do a few more. And that I think is really helpful because you can hit a whole community that may not come to the senior center or may not be in a place to run over to Round Pantry twice a month and to get their groceries. You're bringing it to them. And I think one of the ways to do that with um, the refrigerators are just fantastic because you're really finding out where you want to target people and you're really finding out um, where they need to be brought, things brought to them. So, my, my education has told me that anytime you want to get involved with somebody, find the people who are already doing it and ask them and start conversations with them. So, if we were to contact people who are already doing this and saying, hey, you know, we'd like to put it out there that we're interested in maybe helping out a little bit, maybe increasing the food available. Then we can start to get ideas from people who already know that information. Um, so I think that might be our first step is to find out, you know, who it is. Your list sounds great. I know some of those people and they, they could probably give us great direction. Um, but we don't have to jump in like 
start buying refrigerators and start stacking them and start putting them all over town, we can just say, hey, what do you think? Let's talk about this and see where we might be able to help out with this and where we can go with it. So I think that, to me, that would be the best kind of direction to go in, is find out you know, the people that already do it, and well, let's see what they can do. Do they need more refrigerators? Do they need, you know, Meals on Wheels might be able to pass out pamphlets or little flyers when they, when they give meals out to let people know, hey, this isn't the only place you can get food. Here's some other places too. That's really, I think, our focus is. We have to get the word out to the people who are all over Long Island. And I think if we can start to work on that, I think we'd have a good foothold into, you know, coming up. And this could be the type of thing where it changes as we go. It evolves into something a little different. You know, we go in one direction and we find out, well, how about if we change it around a little? But at least we're moving and at least we're trying. And uh, yeah, I, that was a long way of saying a lot of information, but um, I think it'd be a great, I think everybody in this room is extremely interested in moving forward with this. Our only, and I know, um, I know Christina's gonna, gonna probably hit on this. The only thing we have to be careful of is when we meet with more than two people to discuss these things, it has to be an open meeting. It has to be published and it has to be made an open meeting for the city of Long Island. So if we were get, everybody gets enthusiastic and we get sick people on a committee, <clears throat> the one thing we're gonna run into is that problem, that it has to be considered public meetings if we talk about things. But what does everybody think of that? That was a lot of information to put out there. I think John's report did a lot of that. Right, folks, exactly. Got all the yeah, information. I, I, we talked to those folks. I did. And what it gave me was perspective. What you're saying is there's no action required yet because there's so much we could do. I don't want to just be shooting blanks. So here's my great closing. A, <laughs> does the board have an appetite for doing food insecurity exploration? I wrote this down. <laughs> and I'm done. And, and number two. Can we take a, a small bite at a time? Another yeah. reference. So, if I could get a couple of people to help, I'd like to make a few phone calls. I didn't know about the public meeting part or how that works, but yeah. um, I found that out. to make some contact with a few of these people, probably takes somewhere between five and ten hours between now and the next meeting uh, to talk to these various five or six different people to start to what you're saying, which is tell us more about it. And everyone I spoke to was eager to. <laughs> Like, okay, I got enough. Thank you. I'm going to call you back because they've been eager to talk about what they're doing. Yeah. Well, as you said, they've got their own little fight and that's they talk to each other, but they're so busy doing what they're doing. What can we do to get into that process? I, you know, it seems to me something very valuable you could do, we could do, is to provide an overview uh, of the problem. Well, I, when I went through this process again, Anne was great about saying that's a little bit too much information, so down to so mm -hmm. six pages to two. Mm -hmm. But I recognize you're going to talk to various people that made a list of us. It's going to take some time. I want some quest specific questions to begin to narrow down what we really should, what the board should consider. Well, how should we, I'm sorry. We, we don't have that yet. Mm -hmm. My meeting, with my talk was just surface stuff with these yeah, five right. or six organizations. Ronnie? Right. And I just want to be, uh, ask a clarifying question is, you know, when you do continue to explore this, have conversations, take into consideration time, energy, and resources, right? Are we, um, we're being very specific to food insecurities for seniors in the community of Long Island, right? We're not looking to address food insecurities for the city of Long Island. Oh, no, no. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Seniors, seniors. Really seniors. Yeah. Because seniors, you're right. 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 always right. 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 talking about food insecurity for children. The list got bigger and bigger. Right. Like that. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to make sure because we kind of did allude to that, right? That uh, the, the bigger issue being a one stop shop to where we provide these opportunities for everybody. I think we need to focus on the senior piece. But then 
once this is in place and as this continues to grow, then maybe branch out. We can work with CUIF to see if they're interested in providing an opportunity for the youth. If there's other departments or other locations around our community that can branch out at that point. But I think it's very important for us to stay specific to the seniors as we have these discussions and continue to explore. Well, and I think as we just talk to these various groups, part of it is just getting information. What's out there? What do you do? Because when I talk to Kim, they have a very specific elder share. No, it's not elder share. We used to call the elder share now it's Blue Spruce, where they deliver the home for seniors, home now, whatever. We said that's just a small part of what we do. We also do families, we look at all, all that. So is there somewhere down the road we can talk to other groups? I'm sure there is. Mm -hmm. but I like to focus, I like to focus down for it to talk to expand. So my original question is, do you like to volunteer? No, I said you shouldn't. <laughs> um, for a few hours, I mean, I'll provide the question. I like to meet with you and talk about these other groups. I don't know how to publish it or do whatever it's supposed to do. So you what you could do is you could keep every conversation between you and the person you're talking to. Okay. And then you're going to talk to me about what you want me to do. And then you're going to talk to Anne about what you're going to, you know, what you want her to do. And at the next meeting, we can all get together and talk about it as a group. Okay. Does that make sense? How would we get some first thing from Kim to Silva? One of us would speak to her. Because okay. what do we have to do from a public standpoint? We're just if it's more that if it's only two people who are discussing what happened with her, then it's just a conversation, okay. right? Am I getting that correct? That's my understanding. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just a conversation. Okay. But if another person came into it, um, sure. and, and if I all of a sudden Anne was forward. in the room and she said, well, let me tell you what I found out, then it becomes a public well, let me get it's this, just let me get this members, members yeah. of the right. advisory board. Right. So, so you can meet with five members of the community and not with right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. So two of us can meet with the group uh, and not violate any orders. As long as it's not this internal, right? Yeah, that's yeah. okay. Two or more of this internal group becomes a public group. Oh, but I mean, if, if, right, if, like if two more than two city council people got together and started to talk about something, the then they had to make it a public group. Oh. But not if the public is involved at all. I'll give you a great example, and I'm sure um, Art is going to mention this. I recently got that Art and Maria connected with the people at El Comitán. It turns out I know um, the president of the board, um, Edwina, used to run the hours in. And the new Lisa, the new um, executive director, and I met them one day and we talked about the possibilities of developing a relationship. So I put them on an email saying, here's these guys, here's what, you know, here's what they're at, here's what their interest is. I'm going to step out of this because there can only be two people. And these are, since these guys are the ones that are on the outreach board or on the outreach committee, I said, I don't need to be there, but these guys can do it. And I've seen that since then, they've been able to figure out when they can get together and, and plan a meeting. So, but um, yeah, I bowed out of that because I didn't want it to become. Okay, John, are, are, you, are you clear on this? I am. Okay, so let me see if I understand what we're talking about while well, my phone's ringing in my ear. Um, okay, so you are going to do some additional conversations with some of these representatives of these agencies. With some help from the board. I'll help with help from the board. With help from the board. I was always told never show anybody what you're good at because then people expect then, you to do it all the time. <laughs> then we'll report back to the next meeting. Was the next meeting okay? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, you know, All right. And Is everybody okay with that? So, yep. So Anne and Lonnie will be. And I would just say that, yeah, that it, if there's three of you, it's about meeting together in uh, a public forum or emails. So emails of more than, like, if an email to the from Dave goes to um, the board that really is public records. Yeah. So if they volunteer to help, how do I meet them? I have to meet them separately? Yeah. Okay. Yes, public meeting. Talk yeah. to us separately, okay. email us separately, keep everything separate. Okay. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
rules. There's too many rules. I can follow them. Yeah. 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 Only one. Okay. One at a time. And then at the next meeting, then we can come together and start to build this. Absolutely. And if after that it requires us to have more than just two of us meeting at a time, if it requires three or more people, then we'll just have to do whatever we need to do to post it. Mm -hmm. Well, we can decide at our next meeting how we want to pursue proceed from there. Right. All right. Thank All right. you. Sorry, I went over. All right. Okay. Good presentation. Good yeah, discussion. good information, Son. You did a great job. All right. Take it yeah, away. We're actually right. I'm sorry, just about a little bit over. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, strategic planning. That was me that put that on. Uh, that, that term is probably a little misleading because that came from the Friends meeting, actually. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But I wanted to ask, I do think that if we want to do the same kind of thing that we did this year, that is, made recommendations to the city council, we met with the city manager, uh, we tried to have our, our thoughts in order before we got to um, uh, the city manager, that we really need to have a timetable. Otherwise, we get stuck at the end of the year and we're hurrying up trying to get things in place like we did this year, and it's really difficult. So I guess I'm wondering, what's your feeling? Should we follow something like the same procedure next year, or should we do something different? Sonny. I agree that we could do something the same as we did this year. And because we're already kind of finished right now in July, we're kind of finished with that, with 2024, yeah. we can start planning things for 2025 now. That's what I'm we saying. can give ourselves more time we can start looking into things so that we can say, okay, by when was the meeting with Harold? Was that like in March? That was March. Okay. We can say, like, we're, we're planning by March, we're going to be prepared to have a meeting with Harold and tell him all of our recommendations. And from that, we can plan a presentation to the city council on what we're going to recommend. Yeah. And exactly. then then we'll probably be finished again in June of next year yeah, we'll, for 2024, and we start on 20, you know, 2025, and we start on 2026. It's kind what? of a half year type of thing. Yeah. That we won't go from January to December, we'll go from like June to June. What are the rest of you think? Eric? I think it's good that we don't get crushed like we had the last minute like we did this past year, seeing that this fiscal year sort of is over, um, I'd like to see us, if we can anticipate what needs to be done for references for moving ahead, I'd like to see us start on it in the next couple of months. And we can add or subtract as much information as we can. We can start sketching it out though. Because we do have an idea that needs to be done in the upcoming year. So I'd like to see us start earlier. Yeah, we got new bonds. I'm going to pick on people here. So. <laughs> you got any thoughts on that? Um, yes, I don't, but I'm wondering like, all the work that was done on transportation and housing, all of that, we put a lot of work into it. What happens to it now? So it's gone. It was presented to the city council, That's and they question. we leave it for them to act on. That's we, good question. we don't do anything. Um, I, I think um, we need to narrow our focus. Yeah. So I, I think, think uh, I'll, you guys can add if you want, but I think that uh, we'll see how what kind of impact we have. I think it's, it's going to be very discouraging to go through all the work that we did and have no impact. You know, I've, I've thought about that a lot. On the other hand, it seems to me we have no alternative if we want to have any kind of impact with our try. And so, and maybe we have to try more than once, or twice, or three times. You know, to keep at it. What I would like to see, actually, is I won't be chair next year, but whoever's the chair and the chair after that, I'd like to see this keep going. Yeah. You know, so, so the, the uh, um, uh, 
I know Ronnie likes the idea of having visibility. Right? So they know we're out here, they know we have ideas, and uh, anyway, Art, got any ideas? Well, I, I like the idea of maybe in a couple of months start looking at things, but the thing is, we, when is the decision to be made on budget? Is that November? On September, September? it September? should be presented to is council. That, Definitely right after September, when City Council makes some decisions, we're going to look at the recommendations we made this year and see if there's anything else that we need to add to it. In other words, if we're, you know, hypothetically, and we hope it doesn't happen, but, you know, we, we've asked for a couple of resource specialists, you know, if they're not going to give it to us, I think that would be another priority for next year, you know. And those Try are again. The things that, that we need to start looking at. Get a and bigger, then better, after that, longer presentation. Right. Whatever it's going to take. Yeah, whatever it takes. But that definitely has to be looked at. Right. Uh, Arlene, do you have any comments? No, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll get you for that. Uh, uh, we um, talked about this when we got close to doing the big wrap up. Is that I thought Sheila and I were going to do it, but I was going to continue to keep up on housing just to update people on what's going on. You know, did we get what we asked for? Are they making any changes so that people are educated and are aware of what is going on in the city of housing? I don't have to dig into the past like I did. I don't have to get a lot of information. I'll just be someone who keeps up on what's going on regarding housing. Mm -hmm. Arlene okay. can do it as far as transportation. I think that's going to be a given because you're on that committee and you're definitely going to know what's going on and you're going to hear, you know, everything that, that, um, that can be shared with us so we can be updated on what's going on with that too. So I'm thinking that we can take on other things as we move forward, but I personally would just like to keep everybody informed on what's going on with housing. I agree. And I, like you say, we'll find out if they did anything about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, if it had an impact at all. Okay, that actually segues into the next thing I want to talk about, which is uh, keeping working groups going and periodically reporting as, as you say as as necessary mm -hmm. actually it would be nice to have something almost every month but it wouldn't have to be just just enough to keep everybody informed as far as what's happening as far as it would be your responsibility to do that it would be your responsibility to do that for transportation and it would be your responsibility as far as outreach uh, i think everybody's okay with that you know, everybody understand what we're talking about here? Now, let me clarify something. It was something written someplace that we had Marie on outreach. We haven't actually formalized that. I asked Marie uh, before the meeting if she'd be willing to work with Art. Nobody wants to work with Art. <laughs> You're jumping but, into the fire. Uh, you know, but she said she would. And uh, so she will be the other member of the working group as far as outreach is concerned. So I would say it would be your responsibility to keep us up to date as far as outreach. And no questions and projects or concerns that we have, you'd be the first people that we would want to talk to. Does that all make sense? Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of developing some internal expertise, if you will. Yeah. You know. And like for the, you know, I don't know what I would have done during the uh, presentation to the council if you hadn't been there and I had to do it. And they asked me a question. You know, I, would have been, I would have looked at Ronnie. Ronnie, tell him. <laughs> that's why I finally but, decided to do it because I was like, okay. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's we've got to put our that's, people that's who know what they're talking about up front. And personally, next year, if we do the same thing, I'd like to have whoever the expert is. I really think we should do the, the piece. Yeah. And yeah. do you know what I think is good in keeping along with this whole line is we just put in um, reports that every month, you know, they get included with the minutes. So if anybody wants to see what's going on with housing, yeah. you just look at the housing report before the meeting. Yeah. And if there's and this, a lot going on, it'll be there. If there's not a lot, it'll be there. Right. But at least it'd be an update for everybody. Yeah, there's a reason we can't keep informed. Yeah. It is important to have the reports. Except I'm not going to do it. 
No, I'm, I'm not. Oh, okay. So I can't. I can't. I can't do it. Okay. I can't do it. I can't do those reports. I can't write them. I'd be happy to report on it verbally, but I can't write them. Well, so. another thing is, is we if we work say starting September and we start working towards what we're going to do to present these things. By the time it comes along, we've gotten a lot of information already. I would, you know, we figured out a lot of it. And I would propose that I'd like to put it into a motion if we could, that we have, uh, rather than, than June this year, I think we should try to make a presentation in May. And then we'll have, did I get that right? Does that no, work? I'm sorry, uh, City Council of April. And then we could have March for the city manager a month earlier. And then January and February, that is when we'd have our stuff together. Mm -hmm. That's when we even even have a practice presentation. I don't know how we want to do it, we decide all that later. But we've got to have a timetable, otherwise we're going to run out of time. So I'm suggesting that we have our stuff complete, pretty much, by January. City Manager, March, City Council, April. Sounds like a good plan to me. Yes. The uh, presentation the City Manager comes here in March. Mm -hmm. does yeah, that's get, right. It's, it's, it's arbitrary. Does he, get, does he get any information, preview of what's going to happen in the morning? Do we send him something? Good? We can provide whatever you all want. Have we done that before? Whatever. I don't think we have, have okay. we? So January, February makes sense to be able to give him a preview of what's coming in March to make the meeting yeah. the thing more meaningful. So, well, we, if, if you're saying to make the city manager aware of what we're doing, is that what you're saying? Yeah, we can certainly do that. Yeah, uh, make make sure that you know we remember to do that. You know? But and we would have. It's just that I was afraid of working. Well, it's the first year we did it, so we're kind of learning as we go along. Yeah, this is the out. first time we've done a whole cycle. No. So, yes. And we also brought up the idea of maybe having the meeting with Harold on a different day than our March monthly meeting. In other words, have a separate meeting with just Harold. In case there are other things that we need to discuss at the monthly meeting, we don't want to take up the whole thing for just Harold. So when we get closer, we can obviously look into that possibility I'm to and that. see if we need a separate meeting or if it would be okay to just have the March month uh -huh. meeting for Harold. You know, we've got the next six months to talk about yep. this stuff. It seems yep. like we should be able to do this stuff. Yeah. Oh, we can't. We can always have that as an option. You know, and say we need an additional meeting. You know, but yes. When I started this process, I found this multimodal comprehensive plan. It's impressive. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, a, it's a 188 page report, and that the city would take this on and just. I'm very impressed by Longmont City City Council yeah. the work that the departments do to take on this kind of stuff. So, yeah. But I also want to make clear that every everything I saw points to a growing population of seniors. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. There's a lot being done for seniors, but I think yeah. we can focus on a few more transportation. Yeah. Well, Lonnie and I talked about this one time, and not that specific, specifically, but Lonnie and I agree on one thing, and that is uh, we would like to see this body become something that's got some real credibility. When you go to the city council, you know, they listen to you. And I think there's different ways we can do it, but we have to have plausible kinds of things to talk to them about. Oh, anyway, one of the voice to see you have, unless we speak up more for us. We are one. <laughs> and really, what else? What else is out there? Voicing the needs for seniors. That I, I'm not aware of it. Yeah. And, and um, you know, to, to piggyback off of that, you know, last question is, you know, now that we've done this work, now what? Right. So all of this work is does a couple things and creates those pockets of. Expertise and experts, I'll say, within this board, that knowledge that lives within this board, and being able to, be able to advocate uh, what those needs are to city council to bring that awareness um, to support that work that, that John has identified that city council does, right? So, 
things they may be aware of, things they may not be aware of, but they're aware from this, uh, from a, a, a older adult perspective of what key yeah. needs are and how, how to best support. And, and is there any guarantees that we're going to get everything? You know, are all of our recommendations are going to be met? No. But as Art said, you know, we're just continuing to advocate for this every single mm -hmm. year, right? We're just going to continue to. We're going Coming to back. Work. We're still going to continue to to uh, address or assess what those needs are for transportation and housing um, for, for staffing uh, here at the Senior Center and continue to build on that and continue to uh, uh, grow that information and grow that knowledge and, and continue to advocate for those needs, right? Um, you know, the, 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 the presentation that took place at the Council was done very well um, between Lonnie and, and, and Dave. And, the reason why I went so well is we had those experts in those conversations and just seeing that, and I'm sorry I'm jumping in and this is part of my, my, my manager's report, but just seeing how engaged city council was, and as Lonnie mentioned, like, she's, she, she's presenting information that they had no idea about. And she had their, Dave and Lonnie had their attention, or attention, they were engaged, and just reading their body language, um, you know, I think our mission was accomplished um, at the end of the day. What happens next out of our hands? Yeah, Ooh. that's a good point. We did, we did, we did a very good job collectively as a board to get this information in front of them. And so, um, you know, I just I really appreciate the direction of this board and the, the support this this board provides for the senior center, senior services specifically, and, and older adults in our community. I've got to keep out of it. Yep. yep. Okay. I guess everybody's on board for that. I, I would like a motion on a timetable. January, March, April. January, March, April. What's January though? What? So January that's, that's when we got to have our stuff, basically. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I want to make a recommendation before you do that. Yes. Is, 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 you know, is there an opportunity to have an additional meeting outside of March? Um, outside, if we were to get Harold, I don't think so. Because really all this work is leading up to that, yeah. that, that, that presentation. And then we're just sharing everything out with the city council at that point. I think that time should be used for the monthly meeting in March? Right, because all of those meetings that are before March is the point to that original meeting. The reason I thought about it is because this meeting wasn't supposed, the meeting we had with Harold was not supposed to be two hours of just Harold. And then people were saying afterwards, well, we never got to talk about this, we never got to talk about that. So I said, okay, well, in the future we'll look, and if we feel like we have, we need that monthly meeting in March to, address ongoing things and to talk about things, then we can have it and maybe have a separate meeting. And that's how the idea came up. Yeah, and, that's and, right. Uh, what, yeah, so we can decide that. The, yeah, we can sure decide that down so, the road. That's yeah. Yeah, we my my observation and feedback I, is, as you all said, is this is the first time we have this, right? Number one, number yeah. two, uh, observation and feedback. Right. Just as long as we keep a little, yeah. little, little tighter, uh, um, um, focus on time exactly. and staying on our agenda. Exactly. So yeah. It'll look better than that. Okay, speaking of time. Yes. Okay. Are you making a motion? Did you make a motion? No, but okay. I will. I make a motion that we follow the following schedule for 2024, 2025. Yeah, 25. And that be January, have our reports ready and start putting together a presentation. March, give the presentation to the city manager. Yes. April, give the presentation to the city council. Yeah. Okay, so we're second to that. Second, second. Okay, second. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Okay, I had another item, but I think I'm going to try to do it under reports. Uh, oh, friends. Does anybody want to be the friends liaison? It's great work. And that would be your liaison to <laughs> to go to the monthly friends meeting and to report back on what happens. Uh, I think also to begin to create a bond between the organizations as we support the same population. So we should be talking to each other. Are you I, getting off the board? Tell us what's going on. Well, what? 
Well, Sheila, Sheila was the Sheila one. Was the Sheila one. was the representative, and she, when she quit, it left that position open. Oh. But if John's on the board, can he also be the mayor? I was wondering. Legally, he can. Yeah. Right? Because she was. It's yeah. a, a nonprofit independent of us. Yeah, my first thought was that's not a wonderful. My second thought was I'd like to have better representation on the board. I'm, I'm already there. So I'd like to have somebody else there. Have, have two of us that can speak for both organizations. She did a great job, but I think we need to pump up the connection. Again, we, we serve the same population, and there's funding available possibly. So. Okay. How about we see if anybody does want it? Is interested in so, I, I, Are you saying we should have two people or one? No, I'm, I'm already there. I, mean, I don't okay. represent the council. I don't represent so, the board to the friends, but I just happen to be on this board also. Okay. I think we should have different representative, specifically a, a, a separate board. representative. <coughs> okay. Does anybody volunteer? It's a great opportunity to spend quality time with Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> I forget what I said about volunteering. I didn't mean it. Volunteer to go. <laughs> Do we want to table it till the next meeting and see if we can think can. about it? And Everybody think, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's table it till next meeting. I'll, I'll attend well, next, you, next meeting. You brought it up, maybe you should do since you brought it up. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I careful, I hate careful what you that. ask for. <laughs> yeah, I, I hate taking notes. <laughs> Let's table it till next time. I'll go to the next meeting. All right. Uh, manager's report. Let's see, Lonnie, we got uh, 14 minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't yeah, rush. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. And I'll be quick. Too. That's why I'm on a couple of things. So, um, I already talked, touched base again on our advisory board presentation to City Council, done very well. Um, you know, I think I kind of said what I need to say. Um, um, share it out. And, and I guess in our previous conversation, but again, I just want to reiterate, very well done. Um, again, the body language, the attention. Um, they did, 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 did they seem to pay attention. Job. They really did. Uh, I'm thankful for that. Did, did a wonderful job. So appreciate both of you presenting, and I appreciate all the work everybody did leading up to that presentation. And yeah. thanks you too, also. Yeah, because you presented part of it, so. I tried. <laughs> I got really sick. Yeah, I, was, I got sick. Too well. Um, so there was that, and I just kind of want to provide updates on the East Door. And in, in, in our packet, I attached the letter that I sent out to all of our uh, group liaisons, our group facilitators. And so uh, we put we sent this out to our group facilitators. I put this door in both entrances, our East Door and our main entrance. Uh, but I just want to share with you all the the, the reason and decision behind uh, this adjustment. Uh, you know, we are doing some work to to redo our wheelchair accessible sidewalk in front of our facility. Uh, there's no that that's on our radar. It's on the city's radar. We don't have a timetable of when that work is going to take place. Uh, but because that sidewalk is currently is not ADA compliant. Um, we would need to explore opening up that east door. So we 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 we, we floated a couple ideas. So we, can we uh, empower our our group facilitators to monitor that east door for their groups, letting their participants come in? Um, you know, could we keep it open keep it open for a shorter period of time? So again, we, we explored a couple options. At the very end, you know, we decided that it's 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 very. We've done a lot of work. With our with our guests and our staff to have everybody get used to coming in the front door, we open up that east door to have people come back in. Once that sidewalk work is done, we take that away and ask them to come back in through the front again. We're creating a lot of mixed messages uh, there with that alone, coupled with the feedback we received from a lot of our guests on um, on on the east door adjustment. You know, we we decided and made a decision to to just open up that east door indefinitely. Uh, along with that, keeping safety and security a, a number one priority and reevaluating different ways we can um, address security and safety as a whole in our facility. Uh, but in the meantime, our staff is doing staff rounds to, to uh, 
We all have scheduled times, scheduled days, so we're just walking our facility and keeping an eye on who's in here, monitoring who's in our facility, and that is any conversations we need to with guests um, as well. So that, that, that went into effect July 1st. And um, again, just like that decision that was made, a lot of time and energy, a lot of conversations with the right people around uh, the city uh, were involved in that, that decision as well. Want to update you on hiring for expanded hours? We do. We have made an offer for a building supervisor. Um, her name is Anel. She is currently working with um, HR to to work with HR for the onboarding process. We're hoping to have her in our facility in the next week or so. Um, excited to have her. Currently continuing to interview for our front desk receptionist position, and we do now have a vacant full time office assistant position in the front in, uh, front office. Uh, the Monday through Friday position, 8 p.m. to 5 p.m. So we'll be posting that position uh, here shortly. And, uh, you know, once we get that in place, interviews take place, I'll update the board uh, throughout that process. How many hours would that be? That one is a 40 hour position. That would be 40 hours? Yeah. Uh, currently it's Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. But with our hours expanding, we have some flexibility to kind of look in there and see if we can shift those hours to work before we get it posted. Uh, but it is a 40 hour position. Uh, just reminders, our, our, our facility is closed July 22nd through August 5th. Uh, we're doing a lot of a lot of maintenance updates in our facility, focusing on the front half of our building, meaning uh, not past the billiard room. Uh, this room specifically, I'll use this room as an example. Um, they're gonna come in and paint the walls, replace the carpet. Our front lobby has blue carpet tiles. Um, they're gonna put those car car carpet tiles in room A, this room, this room, room A, B, G, kind of like those wheels, and um, replace the carpet from here all the way to those wheels as well. Um, so that will take place during that time. And I mean, that's that's for time's sake. That's really the, the key that's things that I wanted to do. <laughs> uh, do you have any questions? Anybody have any questions for me? What about uh, any, any, any word on the improvement that the building? wanted to add back there? So right now, um, we got process the deadline for and the CEP was Capital CIP right. was, um, that was in May, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. So we did not have everything in place to to make that, that, that recommendation. Um, this is something that we're going to explore and move forward with next year. So it's just sitting there. It is stable right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and what about um, the classes? Do you know if the classes are going up in attendance or down in attendance? So you mean just in general or mm -hmm. currently? Okay. So right now, I'll, I'll speak for this month, we've noticed a little bit of dip in uh, um, enrollment. And the only reason is because the semester outside, people are outside and a lot of people are on vacation. We, a yeah, lot this of our is regulars true. have been out. Um, there's a handful going at the top of my head that I've known that I, that I know is out, out of town, out of the state, the entire month of June. And so um, that's going to pick back, pick back up um, as weather cools down. And I, you know, when we just saw this presentation, uh, it was something that that now made sense. Um, you know, when, it, when, when, when Zach provided the data for 65 and greater, is does the weather impact you? I think it was sixty percent say yes. So if you're impacted by the weather, you don't want to be out and about, right? And so um, you know that that just that that alone kind of stuck out to me. But as a whole, you know, we're, our, our our trips are thriving. Uh, we're selling out like always. Um, and you know, as we explore building expansion, it gives us an opportunity to take some of those programs that are doing very well during the Monday through Friday business hours to have that evening option as well. So those things that we, um, that we max out in enrollment, we provide a second option for. So our, 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 our recreation programming team did a good job assessing what those specific programs are to provide a second option and we get into this um, into the evening hours as well. Good, yeah, a lot of good stuff there. We're excited. Um, you know, we don't know what it's gonna look like, we don't know what to expect, but that's, that's the exciting part, right? is to, to put it out there, see see how it's going, and assess, and make any adjustments we need to to uh, uh, improve.
improvement there. I went over my five minutes already. You're good. You're good. Uh, Gary Aging. I want to say something quick. Um, you made reference to the data report that is coming out now. Um, that is really comprehensive and really, you know, I guess they do it every six years or something. So this is coming out now. And so Lindsay's talking with Ronnie about coming out to do a presentation on all the data and just show, you know, to have it so that anybody who wants to attend can find out what the latest and greatest information is. So keep that in mind for yourselves. And keep an eye open for when they, and I'll let everybody know too. But uh, this way, if they do, if we do plan, or we will plan a uh, thing. And uh, update on that. Yes, so she has been, been, been out of town. And um, out of town and has scheduled time off on top of that. So we, our, our communication, we, we have not been able to communicate um, in a timely manner, but I did hear back from her this morning with a couple options. So I'm going to explore those dates that are, she is available, see if we can do a presentation here at the Senior Center for our advisory board, our friends board, and our leadership uh, and, and staff too around um, around that report. Did that with you? Huh? <laughs> I apologize. Uh, sustainability report was done by Zach. That's pretty much the same material that he covered at the last meeting, so uh, you didn't miss anything there. Um, the friends group, I went to the friends group last time. And actually, you meant this to be distributed today? No? Oh, okay. Well, then um, a couple of times. I could do this quickly, I think. Meeting, there was quite a bit of discussion uh, over the budgetary process. Over the end, the budget process, and uh, I, I, I'm not familiar really with the friend's budget, so I was just picking up as much as I could from the, from the last meeting. I know that they've got uh, $2.7 million in total assets. I know as far as the uh, last resort program, which is what you spend, draw most of your money from, is from what I can see, is about $8,000, and you can extrapolate that throughout the year, that is about $16,000. Um, the contributions run around, what, 100 You had a huge contribution in March of 100000 so that was the, but over the year's time, it would have come out to be about $150,000. All right. My point is, I think that we need more coordination between this board and the Friends board. And I think you might feel the same way. So, what I wanted to propose uh, I, I, uh, one of the members of the board, the Friends board, suggested of the committee of strategic. Planning. That's where that thing came from on the menu. And I think the idea was to have a three person member, and I think you were on the committee if I remember correctly, to just plan for what's, what, you know, what's going to be done over the next year, you know, as far as funding, as activities, and that sort of thing. And so I thought it would be good. We don't have to be a part of it, but I thought maybe you and I, for example, could just discuss that, or the liaison, if we have a liaison that's willing to do that. We just need to have more communication, more collaboration between what you're doing and what we would like to do, frankly, because you are a source of funds that we could use. I put it bluntly. <laughs> and so uh, that's what I'm, I'm summarizing this uh, Probably slaughtering it, but I was, I'm just trying to summarize what, what, what happened at that meeting. So, um, since I'll be attending the meeting next time, I'd like to talk to you sometime before the next meeting and we could pursue that. Uh, that's about all I've 
about the save off box. I can make a comment. <clears throat> we both kind of have the same overall objective, and that is to help seniors. And ours is a, a mission that's accomplished through the senior center here. Yours is representing seniors to the city council, but in a way we're hoping both to advance uh, opportunity for seniors. And uh, as we thought about this, we said, well, maybe a little better communications between us is a good place to start. That's why I'm here today. I want to hear all that's going on, you know, and uh, I'll meet with Dave. We'll, uh, we'll do a little update on strategic planning. Uh, you say one year, I then come on from my management perspective where I was a development engineer. I like to think a few more years out, but, you know, there's a near-term planning, strategic planning, and then there's a further out strategic planning. But with the statistics presented both by Ronnie and, 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 and John to you, we need to plan for the future because it's gonna come whether we're ready or not. Like you said, we've got a lot of seniors coming down the right. pike. Mm -hmm. right. So, this cooperation is almost excessive. Yes. Thank you. Okay, good. Good. Well, do I have your blessing to proceed with that at least for the next meeting? Yes. yes. Amen. All right. Yes. All right. Any further business before this cost group? If not, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Anybody? Eric? Second. 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 All those in favor of adjourning say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We're done.